Well, I want to begin this morning by asking a question. Probably, I would guess you probably haven't been asked this question today. I'd be shocked if you had. Here's the question. Are you ready? Would you die for Jesus? If a gun was put to your head and you had the opportunity to either deny him, to say, I don't know Jesus, I don't know what you're talking about, and live, or acknowledge Jesus, yes, he's my Lord and Savior, and die, what would you do? Let's say the church was surrounded by terrorists of some sort, and they forced everyone to exit the church one at person at a time. And they gave you a picture of Jesus, I don't know, whatever like, picture of Jesus they want. And they, and they said, you need to step, stomp on, on the picture of Jesus or spit on the picture of Jesus. If you deny that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you can live. If you don't, we're going to kill you. What would you do? Now, I, I understand that this isn't quite the, uh, the humorous tale or the pithy illustration that I usually begin my messages with. But I believe it's a question that it's important for us all to consider this morning. You might not be not sure what you would do. I don't know in that situation what I would do. Would I submit myself to the Lord? Would I trust him? Would I put myself in his, my life physically in his hands? Maybe you're saying, I don't really know what I would, I would do that in, that in that scenario. Well, I think it's important for us to consider that question this morning. And, you know, there's a lot of our brothers and sisters around the world who actually are, are facing that, that question and actually must answer it. Not in theory, but in reality. I was looking online this week at opendoors.com, and they shared that in a month, you can go to that first slide, in a month, uh, 322, on average, 322 Christians are killed for their faith. 214 churches and Christian properties are destroyed. 772 forms of violence are committed against a Christ follower, against Christians. Those statistics are staggering, aren't they? So as a follower of Jesus, I, I, I think it's important for us to ask that question, and I think it fits right in with our scripture passage today. We're in a series called Unstoppable Church, and we've been realizing over the last seven or so weeks that on Easter Sunday, with the resurrection, the story doesn't end, but it's only the beginning. And so we've been following the, the rise of the, of the early church and we've even said, if you remember, that their decisions, their commitment to Christ, even to the point of death, is a lot the reason why we're sitting here today. Because of the decisions they made those many, many years ago. Well, there was a follower of Jesus that had to ask, that was asked that very question. And we're going to hear about him uh, today in Acts chapter 6 and 7. And his name was Stephen. He was the first martyr for his faith that we see in Scripture. And here's the point I want you to walk away with this morning. If Jesus is worth dying for, he's worth living for. If Jesus is worth dying for, he's worth living for. And as God's people, we would affirm this to be true, that he is definitely worth dying for, and subsequently he's worth Living for Now, we may not face the challenge of, of, of dying for our faith. I understand that. We're very blessed for the freedoms that we have. But we certainly face a different challenge in our day-to-day -day lives living in Man Mannheim, Pennsylvania, Lancaster County, and the United States. The challenge to live for Jesus on a daily basis. Now, it may not feel in comparison to dying for Christ, like I'm not doing a whole lot for Jesus, but there are moments when that decision that we have to make, whether we're going to follow Jesus with our lives day by day in every moment we face, there are times when the decision in some ways might be more difficult 
to say, I'm going to choose to live for Christ every day, by every moment, by every minute. They're making a one-time decision for Jesus. It's a set of thousands of decisions versus one decision, right? Well, if you're like me, I can sometimes, when it's talking about living for Christ, growing in my faith, it's, I, I see a big old question mark in the sky. Well, what does that look like? What does that mean? And I sometimes can get overwhelmed when I think about that. So, and I don't know if you're, if you're like that or not, if, you're, if you can relate to that, a feeling like, how do I, I want to grow, but how do I grow? What do I do? There's so much I could do. I'm, I, fall so, I fall so short. What can I do? What I want to encourage you today, and it's something that I think we're going to be talking about a lot, even in the weeks to come, and that is committing to a 1% growth in Jesus, okay? Now, when we break it down and we think about that, sometimes it's like, well, if, I'm, if, if I can't commit all the way, then I'm not going to. Well, when it comes to growth in Christ Jesus, I do that sometimes with projects, if I've got a project I have to do, it's like, well, I don't have X amount of hours to be able to start it and finish it, so I'm just not going to start it. Anybody out there do that? We don't want to treat our relationship with Christ that way. We want to uh, take even sometimes baby steps of growth. That's why I want to commit to saying, let's, let's commit to 1% growth together. If we committed to 1% growth over this next month, in 12 months, where would we be? 12%. And that's significant, a significant number in your walk with Christ. So as we talk through today, I want you to consider where, what area of your life are, would you like to see in Christ, your area of your life in Christ, would you like to see that 1% growth? Does that make sense? Today we're going to uh, be looking at Acts 6 and 7 and, and the account of Stephen's life. We'll gain insight and we'll, we will pull some principles that will be on the screen. So if you're taking notes, it's a great time to do that. We're going to pull some principles from Stephen's life that will help us live for Jesus no matter what we're facing in life. We're going to look at his story. We're going to pull principles from his life. Okay? We're going to talk about the, the basic, basics of his story, but then we're also going to pull principles and say, how does, De- how does Stephen make it through? And then how, how, can we, what, how can we learn from his example? Right? But first, let's go back to the beginning of Stephen's story. Stephen is introduced to us in Acts chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, I would really encourage you to look there. And uh, if you want to grab the the Bibles in the pew in front of you, feel free to do that. We're going to be kind of flipping between Acts 6 and 7 and kind of around. Um, The first part of my message here, I won't be spending too much time in the actual scripture. I'll be doing a lot of summarizing. But we're first introduced to Stephen in Acts chapter 6. So what's happening, if you recall, is that the church is kind of on fire for God and is growing exponentially. We started with 12 disciples to 120 followers to 3,000 to 5,000 plus, right? Which is what we have now. And actually, a lot of people think that 5,000 number was the number of men among them. So reality, it could be, scholars would say, almost close to 20,000 among them right now. So what happened was uh, when when the numbers increased, they found themselves in a predicament. That's the verse we have up here. I'm going to do my best to kind of explain what those two uh, different groups of of Jewish um, individuals were, what described them and why they were upset. But the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of of food. So at this time, the entire body of believers, they were all Jewish, okay? But they represented two different groups with two very different backgrounds. The Hellenistic Jews, just real quick. We won't focus on this too much, but the Hellenistic Jews were uh, no less Hebrew than the actual Hebrews, at least by birth and bloodline, but they were Jewish by birth, but they had adopted a lot of the customs and, um, and kind of assimilated into the local communities of the Gentiles, of Gentiles, of Greeks. And the Hebraic Jews were, uh, they're native Jews. They spoke Hebrew and they were more traditional in their life, their dress, their customs. You see the two differences? You have the Jews who kind of uh, morphed into, into the Hebrew or into the Greek culture, the Gentile culture. And that would kind of be us right now. We're not Jewish, but we've done that. We're Gentiles. And then you have on the other side, you have the Hebraic Jews, which they would uh, live by the life, dress, and customs of 
of, of the Jewish religion. Does that make sense? So what's happening here is, is that the, the Jews, the Greek Jews, are basically saying, listen, our widows are getting, being overlooked because we're not, we're not Hebraic Jews. So it was a problem in the early church. So what happened was the apostles decided, well, we can't, there's only so many of us, we can't, if, if the number is truly up in the upwards of 20,000, we can't, we can't help everybody. So what they decided to do was appoint seven men. Kind of, uh, actually, it's our first indication of, of, of deacons in the in Scripture. Seven men to care for the widows, to care for those types of, of caring needs in the church. And Stephen was one of those men. In fact, Acts chapter 6 actually describes Stephen even in more um, more detailed than any other six men who are going to be filling this, this position. It says, but the only one described as a man of faith and the Holy Spirit. It says this in 6.8. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wondrous signs among the people. So Stephen was doing even more. He was performing great signs and miracles among the people, but it says that he was a man of faith and a man full of the Holy Spirit. Well, as we've seen throughout the book of Acts, when that happens, when someone's full of the Holy Spirit, when, they, when they're doing these signs and wonders, when they're sharing Christ with people, when they're sharing the hope of Jesus with people, there's a certain group and individuals that always take notice. The religious leaders. So they did that with Stephen. They confronted him and... They, uh, they said, actually, I find this so interesting. We actually have this on the screen in, in Acts chapter 6.10. It says that basically Stephen was too smart for him. Stephen outsmarted him. It says, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. That's Stephen. Isn't that interesting? So if you look in, in Acts 6, you actually see, I would encourage you to maybe uh, in, your, in time after our service to find some time to go through Acts chapter 6 and 7, but in Acts chapter 6, it actually says that the religious leaders actually convinced a group of people to make up lies about Stephen so that they could actually have a case against him. That's what happened. So they lied about Stephen in order, in order to falsely accuse him. So he goes before the Sanhedrin, this governing body, and faces his accusers. Remember, who went before the Sanhedrin? Jesus did. Peter and John did, and now Stephen is standing before the Sanhedrin. In Acts chapter 7, the first large chunk of Acts chapter 7, Stephen is uh, recorded, we have Stephen's kind of sermon or his speech. And uh, we're going to go to the end of that, that sermon, that message, in Acts 7, 51. And as we move forward uh, to, in talking about the end of, chapter, of Acts chapter 7, but we want to start in verse 51. This is how Stephen describes this group of religious leaders. Talk about someone who has got some guts and who's boldly filled with the Spirit and boldly sharing and declaring Jesus with these people. He calls them stiff-necked people. Your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. We'll talk about what that means. You're just like your ancestor. You, you always resist the Holy Spirit. This idea of stiff-necked people actually uh, kind of harkens back to the Old Testament. Because actually, it was the Lord himself who called the people of Israel stiff-necked people. If you recall, in the Old Testament, when Moses was going up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, and Aaron was in charge, and they all put their gold into a pile, and they made a golden calf. If you recall that, soon after that, in Exodus 33, Jesus, or the Lord actually says to them, go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I'm not going to go with you because you're a stiff-necked people. You don't listen to God. You don't follow the Spirit's leading in your life. And I might destroy you on the way. <laughs> That's God talking to the people of Israel. So Stephen kind of brings that out and says, you're acting that way. You might say, well, what does that really mean? 
Josh. Well, we'll tell you. I'll tell you. The characteristics kind of in reference is kind of in reference to them knowing the truth in their heads, but never allowing the truth of God's word to make the journey into their hearts where true life change happens, you see. They knew all about the word of God, but they didn't allow it to impact their lives. They never allowed it to make the journey from their heads down to their hearts. Well, why is that important? Well, f- honestly, straight from a secular perspective, from a, from a world perspective, pure knowledge is fairly useless unless you know how to apply it. Now, you could argue with that, I know. But from a Jesus perspective, pure knowledge is helpful but does not lead, I don't believe, to life change, which is what we want to experience in Christ. Unless the knowledge makes the journey down to our hearts and grips our hearts and challenges us not just to know the word, but to live out the word of God, what he's calling us to. That's what I think he meant when he said, you stiff-necked people, you don't, you're, you're closed off to the, to the spirits leading in your life. So remember, as we get into our, uh, the main chunk of our passage this morning, remember 1%. Okay? If you need to write that down so you remember in big letters on your bulletin or wherever, 1%. This week, I will what? That's going to be our challenge at the end. I want you to think about that. So after Stephen uh, gave this long uh, response, this, this sermon, this message to the religious leaders, And he ends it by saying, you're a stiff-necked people. I'm sure that kind of ticked him off. Actually, we know it ticked him off because Scripture says it. (laughs) It's pretty simple. This is what he says in, uh, Scripture says in, in Acts 7, 54. Check this out. It says, when the members of the Sanhedrin, remember that's this governing party, this, this, the religious leaders, heard this, they were furious. We don't have to wonder. It says it right there in Scripture. Love it when Scripture says that, does that. Love it when it explains itself. They were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. So one thing we want to make sure and take note of this morning is the, the, the sharp contrast between the way that the religious leaders respond and the way that Stephen responds. Because Stephen responds full, and in in he's full of the Holy Spirit, and he responds in such a different way to the adversity and the challenges that he's facing in that moment. I truly believe, I I honestly believe that we can pull principles from how Stephen responds, and it's going to help us today in whatever you're facing in your life. That will help you with that 1%, right? So Stephen, being full of the Spirit, is is, he's allowing the Spirit of God to, to be the driver of his life, being filled with the Spirit. Remember, we talked about this. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, uh, something we're seeing in the book of Acts as a key component to the movement of God in the early church. And that's the Holy Spirit's role in the early believers in their, in their lives. But we said, when you're filled with the Spirit, you are completely yielding your will, your commands, your desires, your agenda to God's agenda and his timing. Completely surrendering to him. And that's what Stephen did. It's impossible, if you think about this, this is kind of more of a side note, just I think it's so important for us to remember this as we go through our day-to-day lives. If you want to be someone who is uh, growing in your walk with Christ in a relationship with Jesus, if you want to be somebody who is, um, is uh, making an impact, who is seeing life change in your life, you know, life change doesn't just, it doesn't just happen at the moment of salvation. When we make a first decision to follow Jesus with our lives, that is huge. But scripture is very clear that life change continues to happen over time as we continue to submit ourselves to Jesus. So that's what Stephen was doing. And this is what he says after seeing that the religious leaders, the the Sanhedrin, were, 
They were furious and gnashed their teeth. It says in, in verse 55, you can look in your, in your Bibles. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, we just talked about that, how he was full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So here's our first principle. If you're taking notes, you're jotting down some notes. Our first principle from the life of Stephen will actually show us the secret to his courage. And here's our first principle. When facing the challenges of life, we must look beyond our present circumstances and look up to God. It's a long one. My points are usually shorter. Sorry. <laughs> when facing the challenges of life, we must look beyond our present circumstances and look up to God. That's what Stephen was doing here. It talks about this in, in a similar way in Hebrews chapter 12. And what I'll say about Hebrews chapter 12 is actually, this is actually going to be a, uh, the foundation for our next message series that we'll start in a couple weeks here. And it's going to be uh, called Living by Faith. And we're going to take a, take a look through uh, Hebrews chapter 11 and, and a little bit in chapter 12. And we're going to see, um, look at different individuals in Scripture who lived by faith. We're going to look at their stories and we're going to um, pull out principles and see uh, what we can learn from, from what they went through. Living by faith. This is what Hebrews chapter 12 says. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes where? Where? On Jesus. The pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Run the race, fixing our eyes on Jesus. See how Stephen did that in that moment? You know, in sharp contrast to the religious leaders who were furious, who gnashed their teeth, who took it personally, who said, oh, you don't know better than us. Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. Again and again and again, we see that Stephen, this man of God, was full of the Holy Spirit. In fact, it's, it's, he's described this way four times in Acts 6 and 7. Four times he's described as a man who's, who's full of the Holy Spirit. And again, this just means to be full of the Holy Spirit means that you, the Holy Spirit runs the show. You surrender to him. You're controlled by the Holy Spirit. Stephen remained calm, totally surrendered to the Spirit's control. And if you, I, we don't know exactly what was happening in that moment, but I picture him in front of this Large group of individuals, very intimidating moment. And he's making choices to live for Christ. We want to remember that the anticipation of heaven produces peace instead of fear. That's what was true in Stephen's life. The anticipation of heaven produced peace instead of fear. A spirit-filled Believer keeps seeking things above, Colossians tells us, where Christ is seated at the right hand of the uh, right, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So that's what Stephen did. When facing challenges of life, we can have that first point pop up there again. When facing the challenges of life, we must first look beyond our present circumstances and look up to God. So what we're facing, what you're experiencing going through, it's, those are real challenges. Those are real things you're going through. Real difficulties. And it's easy to, to, to get bogged down by that, by our, by our struggles, to get, you know, really to feel the weight of that. And it's true, we do. We're human. But if we follow Stephen's example to say, when those challenges come in our lives, 
we must look beyond those. We must somehow, by the power of God in our lives, in our, our surrendered life to Jesus, we say we look beyond those, those circumstances, those present circumstances, and we look up to God. Listen to how they responded to Stephen's, uh, to what Stephen said about looking up to God in verse 57 of, of Acts 7. This is so funny to me. It's like, are these grown men or are these toddlers? I don't know. At this, they covered their ears. <laughs> Can you picture that? They covered their ears like a little kid. Yelling at the top of their voices. That never happens in my house. I, my kids never do that. When I tell them to do something, they never cover their ears. They never yell back at me. Just kidding. At this, they covered their ears, but they're kids, so they're allowed to do that from time to time. Not grown men. This is silly. At this, they covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him. Isn't that interesting? How they responded dragging him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named... Who? Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus. He's a better man than me. I don't think I could do this, but this is what he prayed. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Wow. When he had said this, he fell asleep. There was another individual in Scripture in the Gospels who who prayed a similar prayer facing death. Who was it? Jesus. He said, Jesus said on the cross, Lord, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. Stephen prayed that similar prayer. He said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Against them. That's our second principle from Stephen's life found here. And it's this. Our witness will increase. Our witness will increase when we choose compassion instead of revenge. Our witness for Jesus will increase when we choose compassion instead of revenge. If we're honest in our world, you probably can think of examples of individuals, or maybe even sometimes in your life, because you know what? If we're honest, sometimes we get it, and sometimes we fail. Sometimes we don't. You can probably think of examples in your life of a time when somebody came at you, and you chose revenge instead of compassion. (laughs) Or, uh, in other words, you chose vengeance instead of compassion. But we can learn from the life of of Stephen here, and that our witness, I truly believe, will increase when we choose what? Compassion over revenge, over vengeance, over getting back at that person or that individual. Jesus tells us in Scripture, not to repay evil for evil. Kind of the idea of two wrongs don't make a right. I feel like I say that to my kids a lot. He hit you. It doesn't mean you can hit him back. But we're not, we are taught not to go back at those who do wrong by us. In fact, Jesus goes a step further in the gospel, and he actually says that it's not just about seeking revenge. It's not just about showing compassion. What does Jesus tell us that we're supposed to do to our, or how we're supposed to feel or do to our enemies? Ignore them, right? Let them be. He says we're to love our enemies. Jesus is teaching on love. It, when you think about it, 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 it's pretty radical. 
he goes so far as to say that the degree to which we love our enemies, the degree to which we love those who hurt us, irritate us, drive us crazy, is the true indicator of spiritual maturity. Isn't that something? I read something this week in a, a devotional that I I'm attempt to do every morning. And he was talking about this very thing. And he actually said that another way to think about this is that our enemies, he calls them saint makers in his devotional. That means that God uses these individuals and can use these individuals in our lives to deeply and powerfully transform us. In the sense, enemies are not interruptions or obstacles, but gifts in disguise from God. Jesus repeatedly taught, he taught this over and over again. It's really very fascinating, challenging, not something we learn. You don't learn this you know, overnight and you're done. This is, this is a challenge. But he repeatedly taught that loving God and loving other people around us, even our enemies, are inseparable. You can't say that you love God and yet have hate in your heart for the people around you, for your enemies. Jesus knew that it was, we were individually, as human nature, we were going to it's going to be super easy for us to compartmentalize. We do that in our lives, don't we? Compartmentalize our lives to say, well, it's easy for me to love God, but this other box over here where this guy did this to me or this person, uh, you know, challenged me or, or was unkind, however, whatever. I'm not going to love that person. If it's true that our enemies can be gifts in disguise in this devotional, he asked the question, I think it's very appropriate, it convicted in my heart, to be quite honest. If these enemies, if it's true these enemies are gifts in disguise from God, then who in your life might be a saint maker? Who in your life is someone that you face challenges from that you could say in your heart, okay, Lord, what, how are you using this person in my life to help me grow to help me experience some life change, maybe that 1%. And in what ways might God be using this person to transform you? In the very first verse of chapter 8 is where we'll finish off this morning. And this is what it says. It says, Saul approved of their killing him. That's the Apostle Paul, actually, if you don't know that. His name was Saul. First, he came to know Christ Jesus. They will actually talk about his uh, conversion. We'll talk about what, what happened to Saul next week. That'll be our, our, kind of our theme for next week. But Paul, uh, Saul approved of their killing him. Now, what I want, my next point, my last point of principle from Stephen's life I'm going to say, and then I'll, I'll help us understand and describe kind of where my brain is, where my heart is. And that's that we have hope in Jesus because he has the power to take the evil we are facing in our lives and turn it into something positive. We have hope in Jesus because he has, Jesus has the power to take whatever we're facing in life Whatever evil or wrong we're facing in life and turning it into something powerful. Something positive, excuse me. Powerful, too. There's really no way. There's no way we could twist what happened to Stephen and say, that was that actually was positive. That was a positive thing. Other than people being, other Christ followers being encouraged to be bold and, and take the example of Stephen, there's not really a way we could truly uh, you know, say that, twist it in a way that too much, like, yeah, his death was awesome. 
But I will say this. This is why we have this point, and this is interesting. You need to listen to this, so lean into this, please. I firmly believe that the death of Stephen in that moment had an impact on Saul. One of the things God uses, one of the things that God used, I believe, to just begin that process of softening his heart. I was just talking to somebody yesterday afternoon about um, sharing Christ with somebody or praying for someone who does not have a relationship with Jesus, does not know what it means to follow Jesus with their life, with their life. And we can pray over and over again. We can even share with them but it's the whole concept, you can go to that image, of links on a chain. Have you heard that before? You don't know what link you are on somebody's chain. You don't know if you're the first link, if you're the first time that somebody's heard about the hope that we have in Jesus, that no matter what we're facing, that we have hope in Christ Jesus because of his work on the cross and his resurrection. You might be the tenth link, Now, we have the benefit, of course, of knowing the end game for the Apostle Paul, for Saul. We know what happened to him. Of course. Wrote a giant chunk of the New Testament. Came to faith in Jesus. But I, I believe, and, I, and this is just me now. This is just me talking. But I believe that, and I wonder if the witnessing the stoning of Stephen had an, was a link on the Apostle Paul's chain. Change takes time. People don't change overnight. The person you've been praying for, the person you've invited to maybe come with you to church, there's hope. Not hope in that you will be, the next time you talk, you know, I'm gonna, just going to say it in a better way. Not in hoping in that somehow they're going to relent. But hope in the fact that we worship a God who changes lives. No one is too far gone. You know how I know this? If we look in the next couple of verses of, of Acts chapter 8, it actually describes what, the apostle, what Saul did next. Not even the Apostle Paul yet. What Saul did next. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea, excuse me, and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul, Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. I wasn't saying that that link on Saul's chain was going to dramatically change his life overnight, all of a sudden. But it was a step in the process. God does his greatest work through ordinary people fully surrendered to him, like Stephen. So who's that individual you've been praying for? Maybe for years. That family member, that friend, that neighbor who desperately need to hear about Jesus. It might not happen in your timing, but remember, God's timing is perfect. They may need to hear your invitation. They may need to, they may need to hear how Christ has impacted your life 50 times before something clicks. So are you willing to invite someone 50 times to meet Jesus, to be in a relationship with him? Maybe they need 100 links to understand. Maybe your link's 70 to 80. <laughs> but no less important to the whole chain than link 100. So what are you willing to do to see people in your life meet Jesus? If Jesus is worth dying for, he's worth living for. 
Remember in the beginning we talked about what's your 1%? What is the Lord challenging you? What is the Holy Spirit nudging you to do? What's your 1% growth this week? Remember we talked about three principles. And we can put those up on the screen so you can see them again. First, when facing challenges of life, we must look beyond our present circumstances and look up to God. Secondly, our witness will increase when we choose compassion instead of revenge. And lastly, we have hope in Jesus because he has the power to take the evil we are facing in our lives and turn it into something positive. Would you pray with me? I want to talk through some of these things that we've talked about, some of these principles that we've pulled from the life of Stephen, this, his powerful testimony. I want you to be prayerful to the Lord right now in this moment. I want you to ask the Lord, Lord, what is my 1%? What is my 1% today? Just ask the Lord that right now. Lord, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to respond? What is the Lord nudging you to do today? What's your 1%? Ask the Lord right now. Say, Lord, what is my 1%? We talked about the first principle with Stephen. When facing the challenges of life, we must look beyond our present circumstances and look up to God. I want to ask you, what challenges are you facing today? What discouragements do you have weighing heavily over your shoulders and on your heart this morning? because we all have them. Do you need that reminder this morning to look beyond your present circumstances and look up to God? To fix your eyes on Jesus, the author, the perfecter of our faith. So what challenges you're facing, look beyond those challenges And look up to God. If that's you right now, maybe that's your 1%. I would encourage you to take a moment with the Lord right now. Because if we tried to do it on our own, we would fail. That's just the reality. We need the Lord's help. We need the Holy Spirit's power. We need Jesus. So ask Jesus, say, Lord, I want to look beyond my circumstances, and I'm going to look up to you. If that's you, that's that's your prayer. It's really simple. Lord, I want to look beyond my circumstances. I want to look up to you. We learn from Stephen's life that our witness will increase when we choose compassion instead of revenge. And I'm wondering this morning if you can relate to that. If, if, if you struggle in your relationships to choose compassion instead of revenge. To choose anger instead of love. To choose that bitterness toward that individual instead of that forgiveness that Jesus gave you and that that other individual deserves no matter what, whether they've asked for it or not. So who is that one person in your life that you struggle to love? If it's true that our enemies are saint makers, who in your life might be a saint maker? And in what ways is God using that individual to transform you? If you find yourself today choosing revenge over compassion, whoo, that's a tough one. Just ask the Lord right now for help. That he would help you choose compassion over revenge, over vengeance. Just like Stephen. You can do that right now. You can ask that of the Lord, even in this moment.
We have hope in Jesus because he has the power to take the evil we are facing in our lives and turn it into something positive. If this feels impossible to you in comparison to the circumstances that you're facing right now, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to give that struggle over to the Lord. Because he's faithful. Remember the song? Though the storms may come, the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. Why? Because it's God's faithfulness. If you're facing something that well, sure does feel evil, feels wrong, it doesn't feel like it's from the Lord, he has the power to turn it into something positive. If that's you, I, I, you can ask him to come to your aid. Lord, help my heart, help my eyes to see through your lenses, through your eyes. Not to fix the problem, but to show me, Lord, what do you want me to gain from this circumstance, from this experience? If you have experienced that before, if you have gone through a season of life that was hard, that you found like, felt like was evil, working, and you came out on the other side, would you just stop and thank the Lord right now? Say, Lord, thank you for bringing me to the other side. And if you have experienced that, this is part of the beauty of the body of Christ. If you have experienced that, who in your life could you share this hope with? Jesus is worth dying for. He's definitely worth living for. What's your 1% this week? Jesus, thank you so much for the truth of your word. Thank you for the example we have in Stephen. Thank you for the way that you can continue to uh, work in our hearts and lives. Lord, we want to see life change among us. We want to see, by the power of your spirit, our lives continue to be changed 1% at a time. That's our prayer and our anthem to you. We know you have the power to do just that. In Jesus' name we pray.